Striking forces in the most momentous assault of all time were the paratroopers, scheduled to drop behind the enemy's lines. The 175,000 men who made up the air and ground forces for the cross-channel attack arrived at the various ports of embarkation on the English coast by June 3rd under heavy guard. The thousands of ships and small craft which comprised the invasion fleet were waiting in readiness to take aboard their human cargo. More than 4,000 ships and small craft were to ferry across the channel the men who were to land on the French coast on D-Day itself. To facilitate the advance of the troops once the invasion was launched, thousands of vehicles were loaded aboard the same ships which were to transport the men. On the days directly preceding D-Day, the southern coasts of England were alive with activity. The Allied invasion forces were bracing themselves for the mighty effort which at that moment was looked upon by many as the greatest military gamble in history. In spite of the vastness of the force of men and equipment involved in the attack, preparations for the departure of the assault units were conducted smoothly and efficiently. The last of the ships which were to participate in the D-Day assault were loaded to capacity, and the time for departure from the English coast was finally at hand. In the late afternoon of June 5th, D-Day minus one, all preparations finally ended. The invasion fleet moved into the channel and made ready to assume the intricate pattern of positions from which, the following morning, the invasion of the French coast of the Nazi's European fortress would be launched. The moment all the world was tensely awaiting was now only hours away. The plan was for three Allied airborne divisions to land behind the beaches to cut Nazi communications and disorganize the enemy. Then, some five hours later, the first Allied invasion troops were to storm ashore on a 50-mile stretch of the French coast bordering the English Channel. D-Day finally dawned. The weather was favorable. The attack on the French coast was stepped up. The air plan, already in execution, called for the progressive wearing down of the Luftwaffe and the destruction of critical points in the rail and highway systems, so as to isolate the coastal areas selected for assault. For D-Day, the air forces were charged with the responsibility of demolishing selected targets in the enemy's coastal defenses providing overhead cover and rendering general fighter-bomber support. The Nazi planes that got off the ground didn't get very far. Allied pilots gave it the A treatment. which were to carry GIs to reinforce the paratroopers were prepared for the takeoff. The first group of 51 gliders carried about 150 men, plus anti-tank weapons, to be landed before the beaches were invaded. In the early morning of June 6th, 
The first group of gliders was pulled off the ground and towed out across the channel to be cut loose over the area where the paratroopers had dropped earlier. The small fields in which they were forced to land caused serious losses. report came from the airborne units I had visited only a few hours early and was most encouraging in tone. San Mariclis was the first town to be captured by American paratroopers early on D-Day morning. In addition to seizing key spots to facilitate the advance of the major forces, the airborne troops proved invaluable as scouts. One of their most important functions was the determination of enemy strength throughout the French coastal provinces. Meanwhile, in the rough waters of the channel, the giant invasion fleet was proceeding carefully toward the French coast, carrying the greatest amphibious force in history. Virtually every type of Allied assault vessel was pressed into use for the operation. The invasion armada had a complement of 4,100 ships and small craft, and carried 150,000 troops, thousands of vehicles and weapons, and tons of supplies. In spite of close quarters in the channel, the vast invasion fleet made the crossing successfully, suffering the loss of not a single vessel by German action. With all in readiness and H hour drawing close, the men rededicated their efforts. The GIs and the Navy gun crews waited expectantly for an enemy air attack. But strangely, there was none. One of the most important and dirtiest of preparatory jobs was done by the minesweepers, which moved in and exploded mines just off the coast, clearing safe channels for the assault boats. Losses among the 200 minesweepers engaged in this hazardous mission were slight. The Germans, though surprised by our attack in relatively rough weather, were quick to contest the invasion. The coastal defenses, which they had spent years in preparing for this moment, were readied for action without delay. In the early morning hours, just before each hour, when Allied troops were scheduled to set foot on French soil, the showdown battle of Europe was begun. While the troops prepared to go ashore, the savage battle for domination of the beaches started. Allied warships trained their heavy guns on the German coastal defenses, which had not been knocked out by the Allied air bombardment. As usual, the destroyers, in closer to the beach, drew the enemy's fire. With their targets spotted, the warships went into action. While the battle raged on, the transports prepared to send their troops ashore. The men embarked calmly on the last leg of their trip. For some, this was their first time in action. Prepare the cast off. After the planes and the warships had done their jobs, the final outcome of the mighty battle depended largely on the infantrymen. The G.I.s and the landing boats were fully aware that they were the center of attention. Springing to the defense of their European fortress, the Germans prepared to mass their strength in the area of our landings for a heavy counterblow. Somehow they hadn't been expecting an Allied landing at that exact time. For the troops, this was it. The 
British and Canadians forming the British Second Army landed on the left flank of the assault against determined Nazi opposition. On the right flank, the American First Army troops stormed ashore under heavy enemy fire. Our victory in World War II hung in the balance. Three American divisions poured ashore on Omaha and Utah beaches and fought desperately for a foothold. It looked like a tough battle ahead, with the issue very much in doubt. It was a tough battle and American prospects for the immediate future were anything but bright. Casualties on D-Day were heavy, especially on Omaha Beach. 3,000 American soldiers were killed, wounded, and missing on Omaha Beach alone on that first day. Along some of the beaches, landing conditions were highly unfavorable. Some of the landing boats were badly, and so the combat strength of their units was not seriously diminished. By D-Day afternoon, American artillery was ashore and in use. In the late afternoon of D-Day, some of the beaches were secured, and the troops began the drive inland to keep the enemy off balance. Every Allied advance was slowed down considerably by Nazi obstacles. The French coastal area had been liberally planted with mines, which the Nazis always believed in using plentifully. Our mine detection units reaped an abundant harvest in the country near the beaches. Although the offensive was hampered by the innumerable Nazi mines, the detection units cleared the areas quickly, enabling the troops to move forward without much delay. Complicating the problem on the American front was the prevalence of formidable hedgerows in the Bocage country. In almost every row were hidden machine gunners or small combat teams who were in perfect position to decimate our infantry as they doggedly crawled and crept to the attack along every avenue of approach. In their drive up the peninsula toward Cherbourg, the GIs of the First Army, all veterans now, hammered at the Nazis without let up. There were no large-scale surrenders but enough prisoners were taken to supply Allied intelligence officers with up-to-the-minute information about the enemy. During the first week's fighting, Allied casualties mounted with appalling swiftness to thousands of dead, wounded, and missing. As the conflict wore on, I grew constantly more bitter against the Germans, particularly the Hitler gang. On all sides, there was always evidence of the destruction that Hitler's ruthless ambition had brought about. Every battle, every skirmish demanded its price in broken bodies and in the extinction of the lives of young Allied soldiers. Hundreds of broken-hearted fathers, mothers, and sweethearts wrote me personal letters begging for some hope that a loved one might still be alive. Every one of these I answered and I know of no more effective means of developing an undying hatred of those responsible for aggressive war than to assume the obligation of attempting to express sympathy to families bereaved by it. Wreckage littered the landing areas, particularly at Omaha Beach, where rough seas and very heavy German fire resulted in the disabling of quantities of our landing craft. On June 7th, the day following the first landings, General Eisenhower, accompanied by his naval commander-in-chief, Admiral Ramsey, toured the assault area offshore by destroyer. 
the weather had improved considerably, thus making it possible for the Allies to follow up their initial success by quickly landing reinforcements and large quantities of material. The period from D-Day to our decisive breakout was a definite phase of the Allied operation. From the day we landed, the battle never settled down, except in isolated spots, to anything resembling the trench warfare of the First World War. But it was the possibility of such an eventuality that we could never forget. Bradley had predicted that the capture of Cherbourg was going to be a rather nasty job, and counted on speed and boldness as much as upon the strength of his assaulting forces to gain an early decision in that area. His estimate was 10 days if we are lucky, 30 if we are not. All such predictions depended, of course, upon our success in maintaining the scheduled buildup. Landing tables provided in great detail for the daily and hourly arrival of given quantities of every kind of fighting unit, sandwiched in between the ammunition and other supplies which were required, not only for the daily operations, but to provide the reserves to sustain continuous action once we should pass to the decisive stages of the battle. provide a means for sheltering beach supply from the effect of storms. To solve this problem, we undertook to construct artificial harbors on the coast of Normandy. One type of protected anchorage, named Mulberry, was practically a complete harbor. The principal construction unit in the Mulberry was an enormous concrete ship called a Phoenix, box-like in shape, and so heavily constructed that when numbers of them were sunk end to end along the strip of the coast, they would probably provide solid protection against almost any wave action. Elaborate auxiliary equipment to facilitate unloading and all types of gear required in the operation of a modern port were planned for and provided. The British and American sectors each had one of the Mulberry ports. landing craft could continue to unload in any except the most vicious weather. We had simultaneously to build up on the beaches the reserves in troops, ammunition, and supplies that would enable us within a reasonable time to initiate deep offenses with the certainty that these could be sustained through an extended period of decisive action. As in every campaign in World War II, one of the first orders of business following the invasion was the quick construction of airfields from which to support the advance of the ground forces. Experienced construction units built new airfields on the continent as fast as they were called for. In each case, the strips were in use a miraculously short time after the men started work. The results of their efficiency were readily felt, especially by the enemy. Marshal, Admiral King, General Arnold, and a group from their respective staffs into the beachhead during the day of June 12th. Their presence, as they roamed around the areas with every indication of keen satisfaction, 
and hearkening to the troops. The importance of such visits by the high command can scarcely be overestimated in terms of their value to soldiers' morale. On that same day, June 12, 1944, the first flying bomb, known as V-1, reached London. The V-1 was a small, pilotless airplane, which flew at high speed on a predetermined course and terminated its flight by means of settings in its mechanism. It contained a large amount of explosive, which detonated upon contact, and the blast effect was terrific. The depressing effect of the bombs was not confined to the civilian population. Soldiers at the front began again to worry about friends and loved ones at home. And many American soldiers asked me whether I could give them any news about particular towns in southern England. The effect of... Every means at hand was used to try to explode them before they landed. In Germany, construction was being rushed on newer, more devastating weapons. In the final stages of its experimental phase, the V-2 rocket bomb was being readied for use against England. In early tests, many V-2s turned out to be failures. But after two years of experimentation, the rockets were performing well enough for leading German engineers to persuade Hitler that their use in large numbers against England would achieve wholesale destruction. The first non-experimental launching was set for late summer. On June 19th, the hurricane struck us. It stopped for a period of four days, nearly all landing activity on the beaches, and therefore interfered seriously with every operation. During that time, sea communications between the United Kingdom and the continent were completely interrupted. On the day of the storm's ending, I counted more than 300 wrecked vessels above small boat size, some so badly damaged they could not be salvaged. There was no sight in the war that so impressed me with the industrial might of America as the wreckage on the landing beaches. To any other nation, the disaster would have been almost decisive but so great was America's productive capacity that the great storm occasioned little more than a ripple in the development of our buildup. General Bradley had predicted that the capture of Cherbourg was going to be a rather nasty job and counted on speed and boldness as much as upon the strength of his assaulting forces to gain an early decision in that area. His estimate was 10 days if we are lucky, 30 if we are not. The capture of Cherbourg, a major port, was a matter of immediate importance. American GIs of the 7th Corps, assigned to the job, expected stiff resistance from the defending Nazi garrison. Before our big guns went into action to soften up the German positions, American Cub planes again proved invaluable in spotting enemy strong points. Once their positions were spotted, our attack got going without delay. Cherbourg itself was strongly defended. But by June 25th, the first American troops forced their way into the city after a vicious battle and paved the way for the final capture. But first, the GIs had a last remnant of the Nazi garrison to silence. The 
GIs had to finish them off, one by one. Cherbourg finally fell on June 27th, just three weeks after D-Day. The area yielded some 39,000 Nazi prisoners, most of whom had fought stubbornly until confronted by American infantry patrols. These Nazis seemed surprised indeed to find themselves in Allied hands, and especially in such a short time. Their grandiose dreams of victory had never ended in such a humiliating spectacle. After several days, there were few reminders of the Nazi occupation. To the citizens of Cherbourg, life began again. The Nazis, in their customary fashion, had succeeded in pretty thoroughly wrecking Cherbourg. But the Allies now controlled a major port, which would enable them to deliver large quantities of supplies to the troops much more quickly. General Eisenhower was greatly pleased with the performance of the troops under Generals Bradley and Lightman Joe Collins on the western flanks in the Battle of the Beachhead. In their first real test on French soil, they had come through in fine style. Montgomery's tactical handling of the British and Canadians on the eastward flank involved the kind of work in which he excelled. The morale of his forces remained high, in spite of frustrations and losses that could easily have shaken troops under a commander in whom they did not place their implicit trust. Caen did not fall to our initial rush as we had hoped. The battling in that area reached a sustained and intensive pitch. Rommel defended tenaciously. weeks, the battle for Caen raged, but the Germans continued to hold on under Montgomery's heaviest assault. After a month of steady bombing and shelling, Caen finally was taken by Montgomery's men on July 9th. The community, or what was left of it, was liberated at last, and the townsfolk no longer moved about from the shadow of the Nazi conquerors. The younger inhabitants, who had been children when the Nazis swept through France in 1940, were especially happy to be liberated. After the capture of Caen by the British, the advance of Allied forces on all fronts was slowed down. The battle for position and the building up reserves progressed at times with disappointing slowness. There always exists the problem of maintaining morale among fighting men while they are suffering losses and are, meanwhile, hearing their commanders criticized. To offer a lift to morale, General Eisenhower personally decorated a number of GIs who had distinguished themselves in battle. The need for nourishing food and sufficient rest became matters of primary concern for even the most hardened combat soldiers. If they were to stay in good fighting trim, these needs had to be satisfied periodically even though it meant that they would have to be pulled out of the lines in a tough campaign. Most effective morale builder for many GIs was a chance to renew their spiritual lives. To many GIs who had their faith to comfort them, even the prospect of death seemed easier to bear, which were not grim. In many of the liberated French towns and villages, the inhabitants were anxious to demonstrate their appreciation of deliverance from their Nazi conquerors.
Meanwhile, a concentrated Allied attack was already overdue. The key point on the Allied offensive was the town of San Lo, from which Allied commanders planned to break out in spite of strong enemy counteraction. The capture of San Lo was a major step in breaking through the heavy layer of Nazi resistance. The weather, which had been bad, grew abominably worse, and for the following week, all of us went through a period of agonizing tension. We had to draw plans to take advantage of the first favorable break in the weather. Finally, on July 25th, seven weeks after D-Day, the attack was launched from the approximate line we had expected to hold on D plus five, stretching from Caen through Comont to saint lô As expected, the Allies had a tough job on their hands. on the first day was slow, but it was always slow going in the early phases of such an attack. With the Germans fighting desperately to contain them, Bradley's forces continued their punishing attacks. In the following week, he slashed his way downward to the base of the peninsula. With a clean and decisive breakout achieved, Bradley's immediate problem became that of inflicting on the enemy the greatest possible destruction. The Allies drove almost due south through Iran. The first army then turned eastward to hit the Germans' flank, but the enemy contested this action. His attacks, which were thrown in at the town of Mortain, just east of Avranches, began on August 7th. The weight of the Nazi assault was centered on a five-mile front between Mortain and Sourdeval, which was defended by two American divisions. Throwing six somewhat battered tank divisions into the battle, the Nazis continued their counteroffensive for three days. Their gains were tiny, a matter of only a few miles, but they fanatically carried on their attack in spite of equally determined opposition. They used every available weapon in their sustained attack on our tanks and troops. We gather at our town halls to hammer out the public opinion in meetings like this. Sometimes the meetings get out of hand and we argue back when the moderator raps for order. But we like it that way because we figure we elected him to the job in the first place. This particular meeting was pretty much like all the rest except that the moderator called on Joseph. Joseph was self-conscious, and I had to persuade him to speak. This was Joseph's first town meeting, his first and his last. Six months before, Joseph had been a stranger to Cummington. As Joseph's minister, I felt I had come to know him a little better than others had in those six months. And watching him speak as a neighbor and friend, 
I was remembering the day Joseph arrived with his wife Anna and the others. of these refugees at a conference of ministers. They needed a place to live. My church had a house standing vacant. And I had an idea. Perhaps the refugees could have found another place to live. And undoubtedly, the good people of Cummington would have preferred it that way. But then, that's what gave me the idea. The first night. What do people do their first night in a strange house? Certainly you don't want to talk to anyone. So I said good night and went home to work on my sermon for Sunday. Sunday was clear, a good day for church. Because we like to make a social event out of it. It's a close community feeling we have about our churches. We like to stand around and chat before the service. That's me with the blind organist. Sometimes I think it's too close, almost parochial. But maybe that's because originally, hundreds of years ago, our communities were built around the church. First church in Cummington, 1780. First house, seven years later, 1787. Almost before I had begun my sermon, I heard a commotion in the balcony and looked down to see the refugees filing in. Late, of course, as the widow Susanna Archer said. I was moved because I knew they came from many different churches and denominations, Catholic, Jewish, Protestant, and I took it as a gesture to me. So I began again, taking my text from Leviticus. The stranger that dwelleth with you shall be unto you as one born among you, and thou shalt love him as thyself. I was sure it helped the lonely feeling of the refugees. I wasn't so sure about the townspeople of Cummington. Only time would tell.
Toward the end of the service, I noticed one incident that gave me some hope. I guess with the music and all, it was too much for Anna. But when I heard about Joseph's visit to the grocery store, I began to realize sermons take a while to sink in. It seems he ran smack into the old Stove League, most exclusive club in America, and another place where the boys carve out public opinion. Everyone went right on doing what he was doing. And Joseph felt at first like no one knew he was there. But that wasn't true. Because the minute his back was turned, they looked up, curious as kittens. And Joseph knew it. I've given a lot of thought to that day. And I'm sure the boys were just as self-conscious as Joseph. The trouble was, no one knew how to begin, how to make the first move. So I realized I'd have to make the first move myself, take people by the arm and lead them together. Peter, one of the refugees, had been a printer of fine books, art editions, back in Austria. So I took him out to the Cummington Press to meet Jim Orchard. I knew Jim could understand the old man's desire to get back to his craft. It wasn't hard to tell that he'd been away from his work for a long, long time. For all his politeness, he couldn't keep his hands off the presses. So Jim agreed to take Peter under his wing. And as I left, Jim was already promising to take Peter over to see the collection of books at the Bryant Memorial Library, across the meadow from the press. The great American poet's house has been kept as it was the day he died, with his own collection of fine editions and manuscript. Here were the things Peter loved most, things he'd been away from too long. He must have remembered how many of these same books he'd seen burned in the streets of his own hometown. And he must have recalled that Emerson, Thoreau, Whitman sat in this same room a hundred years ago, planning, arguing, writing against slavery with their friend Bryant. And a plan for the work he was going to do began to form in Peter's mind. Then, Max went to work helping out on the widow Susanna Archer's farm. Susanna's boy had just been drafted and she needed a man who could handle the farm machinery. Max had been a mechanic in Czechoslovakia. Over at the sawmill, the workmen got to know Sasha and understand his shyness in the best practical way, over the workbench. During the summer, Joseph and Anna opened a knick-knack shop 
and the local girls got into the habit of dropping around to help out. I used to come by myself of a Saturday afternoon to enjoy a little music with Joseph and the Hall girl. Frankly, I think Joseph and Anna were a little surprised to find Mozart in Cummington. Surprised and pleased. I think in many different ways. While we were getting to know the refugees better, they were learning about the New England countryside and its people. is similar to their own, chopped into small one-man, two-man farms. The soil is difficult, and the weather's cruel sometimes. basket of America, but if you work hard, the autumn harvest will give you back enough for your family and a little left over to take to market. And of course, we set aside one of the best of everything to exhibit at the fair. It's a hard life, and often a lonely life, and maybe that accounts for the way we act sometimes. harvest and human relations too. One day the boy from down the street came bearing gifts. He had a speech all prepared, which he promptly forgot like his mother knew he would. But it made me feel that perhaps my idea had taken root too. Out at the press, Peter was having a harvest of his own. He was finishing his woodcut of Bryant to be displayed in the art exhibit at the fair. And the title page he designed for Emerson's essay on self-reliance was coming off the press. back at work in his craft, a part of a shop. Then there was the night Joseph was taken to sit with the old stove league. That was a good night. I don't say all the self-consciousness was gone, but there was a new kind of respect on both sides.
I think the excitement of the fair must be the same all over the world. To me, it's a celebration, putting the exclamation point to the end of a good harvest. It brings people together to show off the results of a year's work to their neighbors, to learn from each other in good, friendly competition. I was thinking of all these things as I watched Joseph speak. He was telling the town meeting that he would be leaving soon to go home and help rebuild his own country. But he'd take with him many things he had learned from his neighbors in Cummington. Picture of a land and people very much like his own. That's about all there was to my idea in the first place that the strangeness between people breaks down when they live and work and meet together as neighbors. I think the idea worked. At least, if the boys on the post office porch had been reluctant to welcome strangers, they were also reluctant to say goodbye to friends. when you collected souvenirs just for remembrance? Remembrance of pleasant hours? Hours of days to be lived over again in memory? That souvenir of the big fellow that didn't get away and the souvenir of the little fellow who grew up and did go away. There are a lot of those little fellows away now, millions of them, scattered along the wide battlefronts of our war and only some of them will return. A part of them, some little personal part, collected by their chaplains for return to loved ones. Memories touched by death, addressed from nowhere. These personal effects are shipped back to the Army's Quartermaster Effects Depot in Kansas City. A strange, sad warehouse filled with echoes. Here the mementos which outlive death are sorted and wrapped for the final journey home. Through these bins pass the follow-up on every casualty list. 2,000 bundles each month. 2,000 men each month. Souvenirs, just for remembrance. Just for last remembrance. Pair of broken sunglasses. Comb with some missing teeth. A key ring. A favorite pipe. Rabbit's foot, good luck charm, a 
bundle of souvenirs instead of a man. All that is left of those who have already died for us in this war. These and the memory and the tears. Right now, there are enough fighting Americans overseas to send back those heartbreak souvenirs to five million American homes. If our men overseas don't keep getting all out support from us. Work, sweat, prayers, and war bonds. Over five million men fighting overseas and wanting to live. Let's have the men back instead of the souvenirs.